Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me now. That was on purpose. Um, so we should have uh, most of us with uh, most of the people in the room now. Um, welcome to everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon from, uh, I believe, all sorts of different places um, in the country. We've got almost 200 people here with us for this session. Um, so that's really, really great. Um, that there is so much interest uh, in this topic in meadows and reptiles. Uh, so yeah, very excited to be chairing this session. Uh, my name is Lucia uh, and I work for Plantline on a project called Magnificent Meadows Wales. And, and I'll be chairing the session um, today with you. Um, I'm very excited to welcome our main speaker, Peter Hill. Uh, he works for the Amphibian and Reptile Conservation Trust. And he was with them, uh, he has been with them for the past decade, uh, working all around the country and advising uh, natural resources whales and other organizations on conservation of reptiles and amphibians. Um, he is currently uh, working uh, as a Connecting the Dragons project officer. I don't think the um, job titles get much uh, better than this. Um, and he has back his first one when he was eight and uh, never stopped since. Um, I do have to admit that we had a bit of an emergency yesterday and the session got almost cancelled uh, because there was uh, lots of trees fallen in the ponds and Pete had to do lots of, lots of work to, to clean them. So it almost got cancelled, but uh, after the um, big storm we had, uh, but luckily it's going ahead. So that's great. Um, just a few housekeeping bits because we are in the webinar session. You can hear and see us, but we can hear and see you. So the only way how you can communicate with us is by having a chat. And also, uh, if you've got any questions, please put them in the Q&A box down below uh, in your panel rather than the chat. It's then a bit easier for me to uh, troll through them and pick, uh, pick some questions at the end. So the session is going to be for an hour. Pete will uh, talk for about 40 minutes, and then we should have good 15 minutes at the end for all of your questions. Um, just to give you a tiny bit of background, this session is a part of like a mini series of three that we are doing. This is the second part. We've done a fair session um, last month in January with Peter already, and this was a session that was hour and a half long and was all about went into detail on the identification and life cycle of reptiles and amphibians and management and recording. So if you are interested in watching the introductory session, I will share um, the unedited recording with you in the chat. Um, and then these sessions are going to go into a bit more detail on management on various different meadow scales. So this one is about mini meadow and we also have another one coming up um, next week about management uh, for reptiles and amphibians on a more like a larger field smallholder scale. So do look out for the uh, for the links, I'll share them with you. And just the last thing before Pete starts, um, the chat, we are not, you are not able to save the chat as you are in a meeting setting. So if you do uh, want to save some of the links, I'll be sharing with you, please copy them over into your browsers. Uh, but that's it really uh, from me, Pete, you can uh, start now. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, even. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about mini meadows. So what I mean by that, small areas such as parks, green spaces, suburban green spaces, gardens and allotments, that kind of thing and parks. So amphibians because they're tied to water to breed, we're gonna be talking mostly about reptiles during this um, discussion, which we'll land all the time. But briefly, amphibians, frogs and newts are generally tied towards networks of ponds for breeding. In the case of toads, they tend to prefer much larger, more permanent water bodies to breed in. But the truth is, the vast majority of amphibians' life cycle is spent on the land okay um it's very easy for them to have their requirements met just by having suitable vegetation cover and connectivity to so they can move around so even if your site's very small you can 
manage it so that amphibians and reptiles that might be passing through will be able to do safely. They can use it as connectivity. So incredibly valuable. Reptiles. Reptiles is a little bit more complicated because they need higher temperatures at which to function than amphibians. And we refer to them as being ectothermic, so totally reliant on an external heat source to survive. So once we get our head around that fact and start to really understand how reptiles function, then we can make conditions better for them once we understand that. So you can see a bit of typical English reptile habitat there, heather, low growing herbs, and open sand. So you can see that will get really warm and there's nothing too big to shade it out. You can see a baby fir tree just starting to grow there. That's typical down in that part of England, constantly having to pull them up. But on your smaller site, I'm gonna be showing you pictures of the kind of habitats that reptiles use in the wild. And we're gonna apply that to a much smaller site. So I haven't got many pictures of gardens and allotments, I'm afraid, but we're gonna be looking at reptile habitat and habitat features and talking about how we can replicate those on a smaller scale. So very topography, what I mean by that is not just a flat landscape, but undulating, lots of nooks and crannies, lots of spots and hummocks and shelters, sheltered areas, sheltered from the wind, lots of sun traps. So here's a bit of Welsh open habitat. Okay, this is tall vine. Okay, undulating terrain, lots of lizards and adders living there. Undulating terrain and a right mixture of vegetation that's not too tall provides all kinds of microclimates, microhabitats. And those microhabitats provide everything that the reptiles need. So shelter from predators, shelter from the wind, which is often overlooked. There's generally prey everywhere because it's in the habitat where the prey abounds. Lots of choice of where to bask, and what people forget about is they also need to be able to cool down as well. So deeper, more humid vegetation also required. So in case you don't already know, most habitats that reptiles occupy these days, they're destined to eventually turn into woodland unless they're managed. So either end of the stage, so this is heavily grazed here, or moving on to when it becomes woodland or starts to become woodland, neither of those stages suit reptiles. What we're looking for is the mid successional stage, basically. So some good reptile habitat, such as heathland and sand dune, that will form the natural climax vegetation. Nothing will get any taller than that unless we interfere with it because it's very poor soil and exposed locations as well. So that tends to be good for reptiles. But more often than not, the ha habitats that they occupy, they need to be managed. There needs to be some kind of intervention to prevent it becoming woodland or succeeding, basically. And so we haven't got beavers, we haven't got natural factors, everything's severely disrupted. So in this tiny little island, so we have to take charge ourselves with some intervention. So there's a colleague of mine doing some bigger scale edge maintenance with the tractor there. And there's me knocking a tree over somewhere near Neathport Talbot, where pines were invading some other habitat. Okay. So before we look at managing our mini meadows and our garden spaces, etc., for reptiles, we need to look at what features we already have. Now, edges, if you can identify the different features, you have edges or interfaces between two habitats. They're disproportionately important to reptiles, very important for something that relies on an external heat source. There's a lot goes on in these edges. OK, there's lots of posh words for them. Ecotone is a good one. OK, but it's where two habitats meet. It's where you get a diversity of plants and animals, and invertebrate species. And it's also where you get quite a considerable range of temperatures, okay? 
examples of veggies that they're endless so on the top right there we've got some suburban welsh grass habitat grass and habitat with an edge a scrubby edge a more subtle version below there vegetation grass at two different heights quite subtle but lizards really do use those subtle edges fence lines that forms an edge on your land and fence lines can be habitat features that are very often used by reptiles okay this one's not particularly useful is it because you can see it's got a monocle culture of very short vegetation, no opportunities there, no, no differences, no structural variation, okay, no good for something that needs sun traps, too open and exposed. Here we've got a very different situation though, you can see the longer grass and some bramble on the edge. That's just the kind of place you find in a grass snake. The grass snakes are very mobile, they spend a lot of time traveling from one place to the other, so even if you can enable your mini meadow to have a safe route to travel through then that's that's really good even if grass snakes don't hang around enabling them to travel through is really good work here's a picture of some sheep fencing and you can see the adder on the bottom rung of the fencing they're actually using the fence line itself as a safe place to bask a bit of context for you here this is a hibernation site at which that adder picture was taken. This is taken in January a few years ago. And you can see the sun is hitting that, the light is hitting that edge. And just this side of the fence, you can see tussocky grass. Sometimes you'll see reptiles basking there. Other times they'll be right on the fence line. Other times just behind it. But you can see the amount of protection and opportunities that provides for lizards and snakes. They don't necessarily want to be found though. But here's an adder at that site, hidden in bracken, mosaic basking, don't want to be found. Here's another example, very hard to spot when they're like this. So if you can't see them, it doesn't mean they're not there. Something else about fences, they often have wooden fence posts. Now, lizards love basking on wooden fence posts because the posts tend to be warm in the first place, the sun warms them up, and then the sun's beating down on the lizard, so it's getting, beat, it's getting a double whammy. It's getting warm on its belly against the warm surface and the heat of the sun beating down on it. There's endless examples of lizards using fence posts. They can use the diagonal supports for strainers. They can use the horizontal post and rail fencing, and they can use vertical posts like you can see here. Sometimes they can even reach right onto the top of the post, such as this chap. Let's have a closer look at him. See, right on top of the post. So fences, and the fence in your mini meadow could be extremely useful for reptiles. There are many kind of man-made edges. Now here's a road and you can see, although the, the grass area is cut really short and not much good for reptiles, to be honest, that little bank there, the grass is longer and that's enough of a strip to allow connectivity, to allow animals to move through quite a suburban landscape. And it's also on a slope, so it's probably gonna heat up very well. A very small model railway, but look at the edge that's created, the sunny edge, very good for reptiles. A much larger version. So, but this is really performing a good role for reptiles. You've got flat, featureless agricultural land, no opportunities for reptiles there. But look at the tussocky grass on the bank. That's an edge. It's a sunny edge. It's not disturbed by people. There might be trains flying by, but reptiles get used to humans moving along next to tracks and edges it's when they stand still that they tend to disappear so that's a really useful often not realized by people connectivity corridor for reptiles same thing by a road so the road might be busy but you won't get very many people walking on that bank will you it's relatively undisturbed okay the sun's hitting it it's ideal so I flip through a bit quick there, but you can you get the picture, lots of edges. So here's a, a coastal path. 
And that fence line is providing lots of opportunities for reptiles to bask and just literally a few inches dash away into cover and safety. So we can apply these principles to our mini meadows also. Here's another example, some tussocky grass there. This is really important, tussockiness. Okay, it provides all kinds of microclimates, especially for the smaller reptiles like lizards. And you can see it's right next to the edge of a path. People walk past reptiles all day long, every day. They're too busy looking at the view to look at the ground and they don't see them. So connectivity is so important for reptiles. They can't just fly from one site to another, like a bird, for example. They're very limited. And this is where your mini meadows, your gardens, your allotments can really play a good role, providing pit stops and connectivity for reptiles. OK, so they're dependent either on large areas of continuous habitat, which is pretty rare, or more often closely spaced patches linked up with corridors of suitable habitat. And these corridors don't have to be particularly wide. They can be quite thin strips. They still work. It's absolutely essential for connectivity to be in place. For example, you might have a fire somewhere and completely decimate the site. If there's connectivity in place, animals can repopulate it. Okay. Here's an example on a bigger scale. This is an agricultural land, but it's a boundary fence. It's where two boundaries meet, so different landowners. So the grass length is so short, it's grazed inches from death. It's no good for reptiles. But because it's got a double fence on the boundary, you can see that thin strip there providing all kinds of opportunities for reptiles. It's got vegetative structure. It's raised so they can probably get away from the frost line and hibernate in it. And it's a long corridor of connectivity. You can provide the same thing with your mini meadows. OK. So before doing any management, Look at what features you've already got. I mean, here we've just got a tree stump with vegetation growing through it, not shading it, but growing through it. You know how much lizards like to bask on wood that's been timber that's been heated by the sun is an ideal opportunity for them here. You might have something like that in existence already, and it might just need a bit of vegetation clearing around it. Not too much, just enough to allow the sun in. OK. It might be the case of some undulations, like this is just an undulation in my steg and an old coal tip, in fact. But that undulation in the ground, that provides all kinds of opportunities for ectothermic sun-loving creatures like reptiles, OK? Opportunities that the flat doesn't provide for them. Brash and log piles, real good answer to this, this problem. Where if you've got flat land, you can create some hummocks and lumps and some diversity, structural diversity, making log piles and brash piles, often as a result of producing arisings from habitat management tasks. OK. Dry stone walls are superb things. Here's a church with a dry stone wall. It's forming an edge which is vegetated in places. It's providing lots of opportunities for reptiles, both to thermoregulate, to heat themselves up, to cool down, thermoregulate to hunt for food, there'll be prey everywhere there. Even to hibernate, there'll be lots of places to tuck away, away from the frost line into that dry stone wall. If you feel like making your own dry stone wall or if you've already got one, just increase a bit of the light levels to it if you can, if it needs it, or create your own dry stone wall. They will serve as hibernation sites also for smaller reptiles and amphibians. So basically common tasks for reptiles, it's site-wide vegetation management and with your objective to create a varied vegetation structure across a site. Now this doesn't generally fit in with a lot of meadow management because meadow management is generally, uh, tends to be a, a more even surface thing going on, but you've always got edges, even in the flattest meadows, you've always got edges and you may have some other features on the site too. So anything that's different from the norm, any lumps, humps, hollows, anything like that, that creates microclimate opportunities. But often with a meadow, it's the edges that you focus on for reptiles, okay? Something else you can do, specific tasks you can do, which also utilizes um, 
byproducts of habitat management, particularly with meadows, if you have grass cuttings and big heaps of grass cuttings and meadow clippings, grass snakes are egg laying reptiles. They're very rare in um, that respect in Britain. Most reptiles in Britain don't lay eggs because it's probably not a good idea to in this climate unless you've got a plan B. So grass snakes seek out areas with decomposing vegetation, for example, organic matter that would produce both heat and humidity for them to deposit their eggs in. Now, the easy way to do that is with your meadow clippings and cuttings and grass cuttings. They're often taking advantage of manure heaps like this on a farm or failed hay bales. So we can replicate that in a smaller version with our mini meadows. One thing to remember is you are increasing the nutrient levels when you do that. So you really need to look for an area, mine that happens, a specific area like a corner, ideally that the sun will hit, okay? A corner somewhere, a quiet, undisturbed, sunny corner. Create your compost heap, egg laying site, whatever you want to call it there. Use grass cuttings, use a bit of manure if you can get hold of it. You don't have to. Meadow cuttings, keep stacking it up. Here's some students that helped us to create one in the Vale of Glamorgan and we borrowed a load of manure. I say borrowed, we took it because we didn't give it back. A load of manure mixed up with straw, etc. Grass snakes flock to it once they find out it's there. Um, and the thing is not to take anything from it, okay? It's not a compost heap, really, it's an egg laying site. And they'll lay their eggs generally there in the summer and in August, September, you could have lots of baby grass snakes. It's a really simple habitat measure improvement you can make. Here's another one we made in the corner of a meadow. It's in the corner, the fence line reaches it. So grass snakes can travel along the fence line to get to it safely without being out in the open. Full sun hitting it, rots down very quickly, provides lots of heat and humidity. Just keep topping it up every time you cut the grass. And here's a big heap of beautiful female grass snakes using an egg laying site. And you can see it's totally surrounded by stinging nettles, which gives them some protection. Just in that corner, because there's high nutrient levels because of the decomposing vegetation, there will be, veg there will be uh, stinging nettles, but you, hopefully you don't get them everywhere else. It's about finding the, the ideal location for your egg laying site and it, it, accepting the fact that there will be a few stinging nettles there. It's not just grass snakes that take advantage of those situations. They're very popular with slowworms as well, as well as common lizards. So this picture just shows you some fine scale habitat management that's been happening in amongst this gorse and heather. So we can do the same thing with our mini meadows. If you can see just a bit of selective pruning. So some little bare areas have been created there and that can be a management task twice a year a bit like gardening to keep on top of it and that produces a nice sun trap for reptiles to use which is right next to cover so they're not in any danger they can bask next to cover this slide is to show you the benefits of tusky vegetation now this in particular this is talking about millennia so you're not likely to get this in your in your garden etc but out in the wild state where there's more space you'll find this but there are many other types of grass that will form this tussocky structure and tussocky structures enable microclimate microhabitats on a small scale that's not flat is it there's lots of humps and bumps there something the size of a lizard can really take advantage of that not just lizards there's an adder basking right in the middle of a millennia clump like i said before they generally don't want to be found. There's another adult adder in a millennia clump. Lizards being smaller can actually hibernate in tussocky structures as well. It's not enough room for a snake to hibernate, but lizards can use them for that purpose. So tussocky vegetation, really useful. Try and encourage them. Hibernation sites. Hibernation sites, they need to be able to Animals need to get away from the frost. It needs to be humid, not wet, safe from flooding, safe from predators. Generally, it's on the south facing bank. Now, this is one in moorland and Torvine in Wales. There's adders there. They're hard to find, hard to see, 
but that's a real sun trap and it's sheltered and the root structures of the mature heather will be creating all kinds of cracks and fissures and underground retreats where they can get away from the frost. We think about how we can replicate that in our mini meadows. We'll talk about that shortly. So difficult to see the others here, but they are there. You can see one there at the base of the heather. If you still can't see them, there we are. We've zoomed in a bit, but they don't want to be seen generally. They're hard to spot. So there's all kinds of situations that reptiles can utilize. This is a Pembrokeshire roadside um, hibernation bank. So you've got everything going on there. You've got edge, extreme edge. You won't get a lot of disturbance from people there just walking past, but there's plenty of reptiles utilize it. So there's an adder there in the bank, literally probably about a meter and a half away from where the cars are flying past. But it's undisturbed it might seem ironic it's undisturbed by people and the sun hits it full on they utilize it there's lots of mature roots there lots of cracks and gaps to get below the frost line it's not just banks like this they'll use rabbit burrows rotted tree stumps okay root holes and the grass tussocks we we're talking about that earlier how important they are ant hills lizards and slow worms often hibernate inside ant hills the variation on a the theme for grass tussock. Old dry stone walls, extremely valuable. Building foundations, piles of rubble, piles of logs and underneath fallen trees. All kinds of opportunities like that. We can replicate that on a smaller scale with our mini meadows. Sometimes reptiles hibernate singly. Sometimes they'll hibernate in big groups. Here's an example on a sand dune. There's many different situations in which they can hibernate but again we've got mature marum here with significant root structures and sandy habitat so that's creating lots of gaps for them to get in there sometimes you've got a lot of animals hibernating at communal hibernacular which are critical features for them here's one on the gower now it doesn't look very special does it, it just looks like a hedge it's in full sun though but underneath that vegetation, there's a limestone bank with it's like a labyrinth of all kinds of cracks that reptiles can get into. Reptiles are very good at squeezing into very, very tight spots to get away from predators a lot of the time, but also that's how they can hibernate. So we see multiple animals here. This is a communal hibernation site. Here's another communal hibernation site, another one by the road, another one in Pembrokeshire very well used by reptiles, multiple animals. It's a communal hibernation site. You've got a young adder there, a common lizard, a grass snake, a slow worm, all four photographed in that same hibernation bank. These four are just four animals of many others. Communal hibernation banks and sites are incredibly valuable. Inadvertent damage to one, can be disastrous if for example for whatever reason that communal hibernation bank i showed you was was bulldozed in the winter then it could be occupied by a lot of reptiles so identifying special habitat features like this before any management's really important so you can avoid them when you do your management even just removal of the vegetation completely from a vegetate from a hibernation site that can increase exposure to predation when the reptiles emerge in the spring. So they wake up in the spring, a bit bleary and, and groggy, and they need to bask. If all the vegetation has been removed, then they're very exposed to predation. Managing existing hibernation sites often does involve a bit of tweaking, a bit of gardening and selective pruning of vegetation so that it doesn't get shaded. But generally, at the time of year when reptiles emerge, there's not much shading going on. More importantly, you don't want to remove all the vegetation to leave them exposed. They need to be able to hide like this adder is here whilst basking. You can create your own hibernation site. Do you really need one? Out in the countryside, a lot of robust populations, they've already got their hibernation habitat sorted but maybe in your mini meadows you can think about making something so it's got to be a sunny location really don't 
overthink it. It's not that complicated. It's got to be well drained. So banks are generally good because they're raised. So well drained, it's not prone to flooding there. It's got a bit of an aspect slope to it. And if you orientate it from east to west, it will certainly get the sun beating down on it, which is very important, okay? The larger you can make it, the better. It's not really practical in your average small space, but if you were thinking about making, say for example, a dry stone wall as a bit of a linear feature, as a boundary feature, then that will serve multiple purposes. It certainly can double up as a hibernation site. Here's one that we made at work we cleared a lot of trees you can see the trees on the right this is a conifer plantation we cleared all of the ones on the left to create a ride going through it's east west orientated which means it's south west facing you can see the sun beats down on it but every single tree and every root system every conifer that we moved out of there we mashed them up into a huge great big pile and put as you can see put the brush on top and put them all the way along the edge a huge great big brash mound running the whole length of 200 meters in the full sun. Um, animals used it to hibernate in. It, there was a lot of nooks and crannies for them to hibernate in. We know this because we found them at the right times of the year, as in right at the end of the year, close by, or right at the beginning. Lizards in particular really took advantage of this. You can see multiple examples of them basking on it there. So, the basic principles, and that's all we've got time for, basic principles here. I'd love to go into more detail about things, but basic principles for you, keep habitats fairly open, not shaded. So that provides light and heat. And of course, ultraviolet light, which is so important for reptiles and amphibians. Provide cover, normally through vegetation, but log piles, stone piles, etc. but not tall cover that shades, okay? Vegetation that crawls through things rather than shades it, that, that's perfect. And a diverse vegetation structure. So rather than floristic composition, which is important for flower meadows, the main bulk of a flower meadow, but your edges and interfaces, they're really important to reptiles and vertebrates, things that rely on the sun. And that allows them to thermoregulate. That's basically a posh word for heat up when they need to, cool down when they need to, regulate the temperature because they have no internal way of doing so, not like us. So vegetation structure being complex and varied, really, really important. Connectivity is so vital between sites and here's where your mini meadow can really help if you make sure you've got a good connectivity situation in place, be it a dry stone wall, be it a sunlit hedge, Anything like that, we looked at all those edges earlier. I'm sure you'll have lots of ideas of how you can replicate something on a smaller scale like that. So connectivity allows dispersal, which is really important. It allows genetic exchange, so you don't get genetic impoverished populations. You get resilience and robustness. And it allows recolonization after natural local disasters. So particular requirements you can think about for certain species, grass snake egg laying site being one example, okay? Um, hibernation sites, like a nice dry stone wall, something like that. And management methods obviously need careful location and timing to minimize the risk of individuals to habitat. So st stating the obvious, not disturbing somewhere where they might be hibernating in the winter with heavy machinery and not plowing into vegetation in the peak of spring when, when everything's active so winter's a good time for management obviously uh, your meadow management is not always in the winter okay but they're not likely to be disturbing species in the meadow it's the edges you really need to be careful about okay i've only just scratched the surface because we haven't had enough time to really talk about it in detail but here is the amphibian habitat management handbook and the reptile habitat management handbook, excuse me. Both are available as free downloads. Lucia will give you some links to them very, short, very soon, I'm sure. 
I'm sorry we can go into more detail. I'm ready for lots of questions. If you want to know more, there's loads of information on our website as well. And I couldn't recommend the habitat management manuals more highly. Okay, here we go, over to Lucia. Yes, yeah, I think that should be all working now. Uh, thank you, Pete. That was really great. Um, yeah, it's as you said, it's quite tricky to uh, cover everything in such a short time. But uh, I think yeah, that was a really good um, um, overview of what people can do on various different scales as well, and uh, try to um, adjust it to their scales, whether it's a mini meadow or a larger scale. And as I mentioned before, if you do want more information about um, the actual biology of the animals, different species, identification, life cycles, and real details on the hibernation, the timings, and all of that, please do watch the introductory session that Pete did and that I shared with you. Um, and I did also mention there will be follow-up sessions. We've got one more uh, coming. I have shared a link um, with you as well for all of the upcoming sessions. We have one more next week where we'll be focusing on uh, larger scale meadows. And we are also running a series of in-person sessions, uh, whole day workshops with Pete in various different locations in Wales. So in the same link, you will also see all of those coming up. Um, so yeah, let's go into the questions now. We had lots of really uh, interesting questions. Um, I will start with um, one that is talking about the uh, kind of egg laying sites. Um, there was a question about how big does egg laying site need to be, and is it feasible um, in the mini meadow setup? Because the pictures you showed were quite quite large. <laughs> Of course, it's always the bigger you can make it, the better, because you get uh, a greater variant of temperatures. But just your average garden, compost heap, grass cutting pile, I've lost count how many times people have grass snakes using them. But if they're undisturbed and they're in the right area, as in they get some full sun, um, the heat, the, the grass snakes, the mother grass snake, she finds the heat the, the warm air is with her tongue. They'll be flicking out. It's a bit of a heat detection thing. They will track it down and find it. So it doesn't matter if it's not a huge, great big site. Okay, big heap. What matters more is that it's not disturbed, especially at the critical times of year throughout the summer. So if you want to build your heap in the spring and keep adding to it till, say, June, and then leave it alone for the female to lay her eggs if she finds it, June, July kind of period. And then obviously no disturbance. August, September is when you start to see baby snakes. Okay, so it hasn't got to be huge. The bigger the better, but it hasn't got to be huge. And slow worms regularly make use of them as well. So just a, a heap, a well thought out location for a heap of decaying organic matter, grass mostly, that will produce heat and humidity, which will be utilized not just by grass snakes, by other species as well. Just, just think about the nutrient levels that you're gonna create there. So think carefully about where you wanna put it. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Pete. Um, so there are a few questions about the kind of hibernation and the timing of when you should be cutting if you do need to remove uh, or clear banks uh, and those kinds of areas. Uh, when is it best to do it then? And so when does the hibernation kind of normally end? When, it's good, when is it good to do the clearing works? It's very difficult to give uh, a one size fits all answer to that question because it depends where you are and what species you're talking about. Um, one of those hibernation sites that I showed you um, a picture of on the Gower, um, it was in full sun and I said there's, there's a labyrinth of um, limestone beneath it. At that site, I've recorded adders every month of the year. I've recorded them in December, I've recorded them in January, basking at the entrance to the hibernation site because it's got very good thermal dynamics. And when it's a sunny day in December, they'll, they'll come out and bask. Um, but disturbing hibernation sites, the, the best thing to do about them, if you think you've got one, identify them first. And the way to identify them is a seasonal look. So if you look in very, very early spring, if you see a reptile there, it's probably hibernated there. 
if you look in October and you find a reptile, it's probably just about to start hibernating. But just avoid doing any kind of work where you disturb, disturb the ground where reptiles are hibernating. It's fine to do pruning of vegetation as long as you don't denude it entirely, but it's, it's ground disturbance, it's disturbance of root systems, things like that below ground, that's where you cause issues for reptiles. And if you avoid doing that um, anytime outside of, let's be safe, let's say um, March, the middle of March, right up into October, you're basically safe. That's when animals are out, okay? But there's all kinds of other tasks you can do at other times of year. It's just disturbing the ground when they might be hibernating. That's, that's what you want to avoid. I hope I've made that clear. Thank you. Um, so a, couple, a few questions about ponds, even though it's not strictly a um, meadow uh, uh, topic. Um, there were a couple of a uh, few people saying that they've had ponds for a number of years now in their gardens, but they don't have any spawn frog spawn there. What what might be happening and how can they encourage them? OK, um, well, without seeing it, I can't tell for sure, but this is a very typical scenario. Um, first of all, it's best to understand a bit about the ecology of the animals, so frogs. Its actual name is Rana temporaria, the temporary frog. And they're called that because when they breed, that's the explosive breeding strategy. All of a sudden, there's hundreds of frogs for a couple of days and then they disappear. So temporary frog. But the other thing about them that's temporary is they much prefer to spawn in temporary water bodies, not established ponds. They're like temporary water bodies. Puddles, ditches that might dry out by the summer, they might dry out too quickly. But the reason they go for them is because they're shallow. OK, so the water heats up quickly, algae grows quickly, tadpoles develop quickly. And also because it's temporary, there's hardly any predators there. Everything wants to eat frog tadpoles, absolutely everything. And an established pond is full of dragonfly larvae, um, newts probably. And this is the other thing. A new garden pond, a brand new garden pond, is very much like a temporary water body to frogs. So they will inundate it, they will come to it straight away. And also they're much more mobile than newts. So they're likely to be the first amphibians to use your pond. Newts will colonize more slowly and over time. So in a few years, you probably end up with a lot of newts. And in a small garden pond, it really is the big fish in a small pond scenario. And newts will end up eating the vast majority of all the tadpoles and the frog spawn. Now, the frogs cope with this by just going to spawn somewhere else. They're, they're not entirely faithful to spawning at the same site, not as much as people think they are. And they're very adaptable to moving around. The temporary frog, literally that. If you want to have frogs in your garden, spawning and breeding, and you don't want to turn your lovely garden pond into a puddle, then you can also make a second I won't call it a pond, I call it a puddle. You make a little shallow puddle, line it, and clear it out every year, clear it out at the end of the summer, dry it out if you want, and then let it fill up naturally with rain um, when the rain comes in the spring. I'd be very surprised if the frogs don't use it, but it's just the basic premise that they much prefer a temporary puddle to a beautiful established pond. Um, if it's possible to have both things, go for that but it's perfectly natural for as time goes on for a new pond to end up being a pond that's beautifully well-established with lots of plants, lots of invertebrates, lots of newts, hardly any frogs. <laughs> that's just the natural cycle, how it goes. Thank you, that's, that's really interesting. It's kind of contrary to what uh, most people think, what I thought <laughs> as well. Um, this is an interesting question, um, very kind of relevant to the kind of urban, urban meadow areas. Someone in a sub suburban situation, uh, can amphibians and reptiles use driveways and pavements for mobility like hedgehogs do? They do, but they're very open to being trodden on, run over, etc. cetera, um, falling down gully pots, that, that kind of stuff. Roads are a real hazard for them, real hazard for them. Um, they do use them because they haven't got much choice. 
um, and they will still get to ponds in desperate situations. Toads is a good example. They're always getting run over on, on roads. And the bad thing about toads is that when a male toad comes across a road and he sees the open expanse, he'll often turn around and face the wrong way and wait for females because it's a good place to intercept them until they get run over loads. So they, can, they will use drives because they have to, especially when breeding comes, particularly amphibians. Reptiles avoid them at all costs, but you will see them basking on tarmac edges, particularly at a time of year when female reptiles are full of young, when they really want to boost their gestation. You'll see them, adders, for example, basking at the edge of car parks um, towards, towards the high summer when they're just about to drop their babies, okay? And then they disappear again when they don't need to be using them. So don't rely on drives and roads for, for them to use. Um, try and get some kind of structural diversity going in, in, in some form of hedge, bank, dry stone wall, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a tricky one. <laughs> Very. Um, uh, can you please just give a bit more information on what a brush pile is? Um, yeah, it's very easy for me to just say that easily because I, I spend my winter creating huge piles of brash inadvertently because we have to cut a lot of trees uh, that shade ponds. Um, so a brash pile, if you've got some logs, big heavy logs at the bottom, dressed with branches and twigs on top, smashed up, mashed up small so it's not sticking up everywhere, just a big structurally complex and diverse big mess of timber it will be colonized by all kinds of invertebrates they'll start the decaying process it will provide loads of food for amphibians and reptiles it provide lots of opportunity for them to shelter whilst gorging themselves on it um, they're really easy to make and it's up to you how you do it and how big you make it just remember don't put heavy stuff on top of light stuff so start off with your heavy logs or rocks anything that's um, going to create a diverse structure and dress it up with smaller stuff okay you can even dress it with soil so you can hide the whole thing with a bit of soil reptiles will still find their way in there as will amphibians you can maybe throw some flower wildflower seed on top of it okay you can make all kinds it's about making opportunities for microclimates so instead of just having a flat flat surface whatever kinds of lumps and bumps and intricate structurally diverse mounds of things you can create and it sounds messy but you can make it really beautiful with time it looks ugly to start with but you can make it look beautiful in time quite quickly thank you and um, a couple of questions about uh, wet meadows uh, so people were asking whether reptiles can flourish in a wet meadow um, or is it mainly just amphibians In a wet meadow? Yeah. Yeah, in wetter meadows. Can, uh, are they good for reptiles as well? Or is depends it what, amphibians? It depends what species you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, amphibians, of course. But if you think about grass snakes, grass snakes feed on amphibians. So they're not going to be far away. So I regularly see grass snakes basking on, I'm going to go on about tusky vegetation again, basking on tussocks that are protruding from the water. I've seen adders doing that too. Adders will also predate frogs, especially young adders. They often feed on young frogs and they don't have to even envenomate them. They don't need any venom for frogs. So I've seen adders basking on tussocky grass surrounded by water, grass snakes and countless lizards. So yes, if there's the structural diversity and variation for them, yeah, absolutely, they can use wet meadows. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple of questions about more of the management, I guess, um, about the kind of grazing of the tussocks and how many animals and all of that. So we will be talking a bit more about this uh, next week in the session. So uh, whoever is interested in that a bit more, please do join us for the for the next week. But generally, if you go by the kind of stocking density, that's good for conservation grazing. And you can find the stocking densities online that generally then works for everything that's really good for flowers, but it's going to be really good for uh, keeping all the other wildlife as well. So with the tussocks and molinia, we don't want to completely get rid of it, obviously, because it's the natural part of those wet meadows. Uh, but if we do leave it ungrazed completely, it can just overtake uh, 
over lots of other wildflowers. So you kind of want to keep an eye on it and do some grazing, but not much. Sure. Can, can I say something about yeah. grazing? It's, I deliberately avoided it in this one because yeah. we're talking about <laughs> mini meadows, but I will be talking about it in detail with, with the other one. Um, the, the common, Lucia has just alluded to it really, that the common mistake with grazing with reptiles is overgrazing. Um, it needs to be generally pretty light grazing and not removing all those features that Lucy had just described, basically. But I'm going to bang on about that next time. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is a bit more of a, I guess, um, roadside verge management question, but I think it's, it's a really interesting one. What impact uh, does regular mowing of roadside verges and premium hedgerows can have on hibernation sites? It depends how it's done, when it's done, and the severity of, of the work. I mean, to be honest, vegetation, careful and sensitive vegetation management of verges like that is, is to be encouraged, absolutely encouraged. Um, keeping the grass short throughout the summer, it's pretty easy to do. If you do it on a really hot day, then there aren't going to be any reptiles about. It's a popular misconception that reptiles are around on a hot day, that they're not. They, they don't need to be. They tend to be tucked away. Um, and if you are concerned about cutting grass where there's reptiles, you can always do it with a double cut. Just, we do it all the time. So you cut an initial cut, which is, say, uh, 30 centimetres high or something. So you're not going down to the ground, mincing things up. And that sword height allows things to move out of the way. We, we call it passive displacement. So you displace the animals. And then if you want to go shorter, you can go shorter again, but we don't do it in one, one episode, if that makes any sense. It gives you the animals a chance to get out of the way. Yeah, that's really interesting. Because but generally that's interesting. roadside verges, so, sorry, generally roadside verges are managed so that people can see when they're driving. Um, hedges as well, if it's not too severe, Remember what I was saying about the root structure and below ground, that, that's what's important in the hedges. So if you're not disturbing the roots, you can be fairly brutal at other times of the year if you're not disturbing the root structure, okay? That's, that's the important thing that they, it must never be disturbed. Um, just being very careful, thinking about when you do it and how you do it. Uh, like I say, two cuts on occasion, that can work, okay? There's, nothing's impossible, you just have to, think about it first yeah that would be kind of in the ideal world um our recommendation for hay meadow cutting as well is to uh, we would say phase it out so again you don't want to cut everything um mid-july because then all the flowers are gone at the same time and then the insects will be like where where do we go so again like peter was saying ideally you might want to cut part of your meadow in july and maybe cut another part in september and also leave the uncut edges around, which are perfect for reptiles and lots of other insects as well. So it kind of all links nicely. A um, couple of questions about dead hedges. Are dead hedges good for reptiles um, or could dead hedges be a good alternative to, a, to a brush piles in a smaller, more confined area? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. We, we make them all the time. We generally make them when we don't want dogs to go into ponds, we try and to stop dogs trashing great crested newt ponds. We're always making dead edges like that. Um, yeah, it's the same thing. It, it's a brash pile and it's a longitudinal one. So you're creating edge. So it's a win, win, win situation. Yeah, very good. Keep making dead edges. Mm -hmm, perfect. <laughs> um, why do I end up finding frogs and toads in the middle of large meadows far away from any water source? Are they dispersing or lost? because they spend the vast majority of their lives on land. As I said, the temporary frog will spend about a week of his life in the water. The rest of the time he's on the land. Toads are far more terrestrial based. They'll travel two kilometers or more to breed. And then they spend the entire of the rest of the time on the land, traveling quite distances. So it's far from unusual to find them. They are both very much terrestrial species that are just tied to breed in water, but they don't spend a great deal of time in the water. Occasional frogs, occasional individual frogs, their territory will include a pond. So you'll see them sitting in a pond now and again, but they spend the vast majority of their time on the land. The, the common frog 
is part of a group of frogs known as grass frogs. It says it all, doesn't it? They spend the time in grass rather than in, in, in ponds. So it's perfectly natural for you to find them quite a long distance away from ponds. There might be a water body that you're not aware of that is perfectly fine for them. It might be a really shallow ditch, might be a really shallow puddle that you're not aware of. It's not just ponds, especially for frogs. Toads, they like a big, big lake, but you'll still find them miles away from water on a regular basis. So what you do in your mini meadows, you can provide habitat for amphibians for the terrestrial part of their life, even if you haven't got a pond, and you will find newts, frogs, toads, using your terrestrial habitat features you create, even if you haven't got a pond, even if your next door neighbor hasn't got a pond, they need that terrestrial habitat and connectivity. It's something a lot of people forget about. Um, you've made a discovery by finding them in the middle of a meadow. It's perfectly natural. Mm -hmm. That's great, thank you. Um, we probably have time for a couple more questions. Um, this one is a bit more about kind of legal aspects of um, relocations. Um, I have a small field which has been followed for five years with no reptiles. Is it possible and legal to relocate snakes and lizards? Could you? I lost you a little bit there, Lucia. Could you say? Uh, was it? Is it possible? An area's lost reptiles, and can they re? Yes. Is it possible and legal to relocate snakes and lizards? It is possible and it is legal, and environment ecological consultants do it all the time. The only thing is, it doesn't really work very well very often. Um, it can do. It can do, but with adult animals they generally try and get back to where they came from and fail to do so and either starve to death or get predated or fail on the way because adult reptiles they will just try to get back to where they're from when we do species reintroductions um for example the sand lizard reintroduction we use we release juveniles and then the juveniles disperse just like in nature we we, we we release juveniles at just the same time of year when they would naturally appear and they spread and they disperse. Adults, it's very difficult to get them to do what you want them to do because they'll just try and go back. Um, you've also got to be concerned about the potential to spread disease from one area to another, which does happen a lot. Um, it's, it's good thinking. It's on days. If you have, if your situation is where, for example, an area of habitat has been destroyed through fire or something like that, then if you have connectivity corridors in place, then reptiles will find it again. They, they will get there again. The, the connectivity, I can't stress, overstress how important it is. And contributing to that with your mini meadows will, will, will really help. Um, yeah. But, avoid translocations and moving stuff around um, unless you absolutely have to and you'd seek advice about that um, I would be inclined to do what we do which is just do habitat manipulation in strategic areas and enable corridors of connectivity to function and reptiles do get there themselves particularly lizards and grass snakes particularly grass snakes grass snakes are incredibly mobile Adders, by comparison, are very sedentary and don't like to cross anything other than ideal habitat. Grass snakes will travel across anything to get somewhere. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yes, it sounds like it's quite similar to um, uh, creative meadows as well. In some areas, you kind of want to create the perfect conditions first, because if you try and sow you know, wildflower seeds into a soil that is high in nutrients, it can fail so you are kind of aiming to create the right conditions first before you and bring the bring the seeds in um so yeah it's a bit similar <laughs> if we finish off on yeah. the last question there were a couple of questions about slow worms uh do slow worms have the same preference of habitat i'm guessing uh, they meant in comparison to other um reptiles and how do you encourage them in uh, in your garden Slow worms are probably one of the easiest reptiles to encourage into your garden. Um, 
they don't spend as much time basking in the open as the other reptiles. They tend to prefer thermoregulating properly, as in burying themselves in warm situations, such as a compost heap or a grass pile, something like that, or resting beneath objects that have heated up in the sun, okay? Now, they love tussocky, overgrown grass. They absolutely love that situation. They like anthills. They love anthills. They'll be munching away on ant pupae when they're inside them. Um, overgrown rank grass, lots of sun, lots of hummocks, banks, not flat, basically. A compost heap, lots of soft-bodied grubs, because that's what they like to eat. Slow worms feed on slow-moving, soft-bodied animals such as small slugs, occasional earthworms, all kinds of beetle larvae, leather jackets, that kind of stuff, you know, different to, to the other lizards that predate fast moving prey. So slow worms, clues in the name that they prefer slower moving soft bodied prey. But if you've got overgrown tussocky, rank grass, banks, exposed to sunshine, if slow worms can get there, then they will do. OK, uh, old, somewhat abandoned, a little bit scruffy allotments are often teeming with slow worms look for that reason. OK, um, yeah, I wish you luck with your slow worms and fantastic things to have in the garden. Superb. Great. Thank you so much, Pete, for answering all the questions as well. And again, thank you very much for uh, for your presentation. It's really great. I think people really enjoyed it. There's lots of thank yous in the in the chat. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, Pete, and thank you everyone for so many interesting questions. I think we had a really really good Q and A session as well. So, so yeah, everyone, I hope learned uh, loads, and hopefully uh, we'll see you next week in uh, on Pete's next uh, follow up session. Um, yeah, if you have any other questions, please do just get in touch with us. There, I'm sure there are some contacts on Pete's website as well, and there will be some emails. Uh, in the follow-up um, emails as well after the session. So yeah, thank you so much and have the have a great rest of your days, everyone. Bye. Bye everyone.